Hey everyone, this is Alyssa, critical care pharmacy resident. And in this clinical pearl, I will provide an overview of toxic alcohol poisoning. Here I've listed some of the toxic alcohols that are most commonly implicated in toxic alcohol poisonings, along with their most common sources, and then some unique things to look out for with each one. There are some things that I want to pull out. Uh, first of all, starting with methanol. The most common sources for methanol include moonshine and then also windshield washer fluid. If methanol poisoning is not treated rapidly enough, it can result in irreversible eye damage and blindness, along with the potential for being fatal if it's not treated in a timely fashion. Ethylene glycol is often found in antifreeze, which is the most common source in ethylene glycol poisoning. And of note, ethylene glycol is metabolized to oxalic acid, which can precipitate with calcium, leading to crystal urea and subsequent acute kidney injury. Propylene glycol is also used as an antifreeze, although it's marketed as a safer option relative to ethylene glycol. Propylene glycol is actually most commonly found in the parenteral medications that we use on a daily basis. One of the most notable examples is lorazepam because it contains some of the highest amounts of propylene glycol. So interestingly, if we give patients high doses of lorazepam, we actually have some potential to cause iatrogenic propylene glycol poisoning, although this really doesn't happen until we get into extremely high doses. So in an adult patient, this doesn't really become a concern until we give doses greater than 10 milligrams an hour, and until we do so for a period of longer than a couple of days. That being said, though, it's still important for us to be aware of this and to keep it in mind when we're dealing with patients who might be more vulnerable to propylene glycol toxicity, such as those with poor renal function, uh, as well as pediatric patients. Before we look at toxic alcohol metabolism, I do feel like it's helpful to have a prototype, and in this case, I'll use ethanol because I think it's one that we tend to be more familiar with. In general, though, all alcohol products undergo a similar metabolic pathway in which the parent compound is metabolized by an alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme into an aldehyde, and then the aldehyde is subsequently further oxidized by aldehyde dehydrogenase into a carboxylic acid. So in the case of ethanol, um, as you know, the parent compound is inebriating, and that's similar to other toxic alcohols. Ethanol, though, is metabolized to ADH into acetaldehyde, which is actually more toxic than the parent compound. And this is something that we're going to see with some of the other toxic alcohols as well. Um, so it's actually this aldehyde that is in part to blame for some of the hangover symptoms that you may experience after ingesting too much ethanol. Eventually, though, the aldehyde dehydrogenase enzyme kicks in, and it turns that aldehyde into acetic acid, which is more hydrophilic and therefore readily excreted by the kidneys. So that is alcohol metabolism in a nutshell. And then some side clinical pearls that I want to mention here. Um, if you are familiar with disulfiram, which is a, a medication used as a deterrent for individuals with an alcohol abuse disorder, um, disulfiram actually works by inhibiting aldehyde dehydrogenase. So it basically acts by preventing conversion of the aldehyde into acetate, thereby increasing levels of the aldehyde and basically prolonging a patient's hangover from drinking alcohol with the hopes that this will prevent the individual from wanting to ingest ethanol. Metronidazole can also have this as an unintended consequence, so it is important that we educate our patients to avoid consuming alcohol while they are on metronidazole. So here you can see the metabolic pathways of all of the other toxic alcohols, and again, this is really similar to ethanol metabolism. First, we have ingestion of the parent compound. These parent compounds, like ethanol, are directly inebriating. However, they're really not as toxic uh, in the parent compound form as they are once they're metabolized to some of these byproducts. The one exception is isopropanol, which is toxic in and of itself. 
In general, toxic alcohol poisoning treatment consists of supportive care, such as fluids, uh, management of airway and ventilation if needed, and then the use of an alcohol dehydrogenase inhibitor, dialysis to remove the compound and the toxic metabolites, as well as cofactors to decrease toxic metabolite levels, and then lastly, sodium bicarbonate may be used in select situations as well. One of the most important treatment strategies in toxic alcohol poisoning is the use of an alcohol dehydrogenase inhibitor. The idea behind the use of a ADH inhibitor is that we prevent the metabolism of the toxic alcohol, the parent compound, to its more harmful metabolites. We can use either ethanol or fomepazole to accomplish this. And the reason that these agents work is because they have a higher affinity for the alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme compared to these other parent compounds. So they'll come in and preoccupy the enzyme, thereby preventing the other toxic alcohol from being metabolized to its harmful metabolites. I included ethanol mainly from a historical perspective because truthfully, it's not really used in clinical practice anymore now that we have a safer alternative in the form of fomepazole. That being said, though, there could be certain circumstances where fomepazole is not available or certain geographical areas where there's no access to fomepazole. And in those cases, ethanol represents a potential alternative. The major downfalls of ethanol administration are that it requires frequent monitoring and it has a narrow therapeutic index. And it also has more side effects relative to fomepazole because, as I mentioned earlier, ethanol is metabolized to acetaldehyde, which has toxic effects in and of itself. Our current mainstay for alcohol dehydrogenase inhibition is fomepazole or antazole. Fomepazole was specifically developed as an alcohol dehydrogenase inhibitor, and it's gained FDA approval for both ethylene glycol and for methanol poisoning. Fomepazole has a much higher ADH affinity relative to ethanol, so it is more effective at inhibiting the ADH enzyme. Fomepazole is given as an IV injection as a loading dose, followed by a maintenance dose every 12 hours. And of note, if it's continued beyond a 48-hour period, we should actually increase the dose because it has the ability to induce its own metabolism, uh, thereby increasing the amount of fomepazole that the patient requires to maintain therapeutic levels. If a patient is undergoing dialysis, which is going to be common in the event of a toxic alcohol poisoning, then ideally fomepazole should be administered after the dialysis because it can be removed during the hemodialysis session. Fomepazole is a really clean drug. It has very few side effects. Uh, the one disadvantage is it is relatively expensive. Also keep in mind, fomepazole should not be used in an isopropanol ingestion because as mentioned earlier, isopropanol is the exception in which the parent compound is actually more harmful than its metabolites. Hemodialysis is also a common modality used in the treatment of a toxic alcohol poisoning because it can help pull off both the parent compound as well as some of those toxic metabolites. There are several indications that indicate that a patient's most likely to benefit from dialysis, and these include a metabolic acidosis with an elevated anion gap, and then also end organ damage, and especially acute kidney injury. Acute kidney injury can not only be the result of a toxic alcohol poisoning, but it can also worsen the severity of the poisoning because many of these metabolites are eliminated primarily via the kidneys. And then a cutoff of a methanol or ethylene glycol level greater than 50 milligrams per deciliter has also been used to help identify patients who might benefit from dialysis. However, it's worth pointing out that oftentimes these levels aren't readily available in a laboratory. They may need to be sent out. So that really uh, kind of limits their utility in the acute setting. And it's often going to ultimately rely on the judgment to the provider to determine whether the patient's likely to benefit from dialysis. If dialysis is used in the situation of a toxic alcohol poisoning, intermittent hemodialysis is preferred because it more rapidly pulls off the solutes compared to a continuous or a slow renal replacement therapy. 
Some other therapies that may be useful in a toxic alcohol poisoning include B vitamins as well as sodium bicarbonate. So in the case of methanol poisoning, folic acid and sodium bicarbonate may be used as both of these products help in the conversion of formic acid into carbon dioxide and water, which can then be excreted. In the case of ethylene glycol, uh, vitamin B1 or thiamine and then B6, which is pyridoxine, can both be used. And the idea behind this is that um, these B vitamins shunt the metabolism away from the formation of oxalic acid and uh, promote the formation of less toxic metabolites from ethylene glycol ingestion. Now, a lot of this is really theoretical, just based on kind of the chemistry, and it's never really been proven in an in vivo setting. Uh, however, these therapies are really quite safe, so there's little harm and potential benefit. In summary, toxic alcohols are commonly implicated in ingestions, and some of the most common examples include methanol, ethylene glycol, and isopropanol. Treatment consists first and foremost of supportive care, fomepazole, particularly for methanol or ethylene glycol ingestion, although again, fomepazole should be avoided in isopropanol ingestion, and then dialysis. Vitamin B cofactors and sodium bicarbonate may also be used to help prevent the buildup of toxic metabolites. And that concludes my clinical pearl on toxic alcohols. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to shoot me a message. And thank you for listening.